This week's episode is presented by 1895 Films and our content partners, Peter Hamilton's Documentary Business, a newsletter for documentary professionals, and Sunny Side of the Dock, the international marketplace for documentary and narrative experiences, coming to La Rochelle, France in June 2022. In the summer of 1899, an amateur singer named Lee B. Woodcock positioned himself in front of a strange mechanical contraption. So if you're yelling down into this thing with a horn to amplify your, your voice, you can get that needle vibrating. This is, this is the basic phonographic principle. That's Dr. Michael Conchalian. I'm going to tell you more about him in a minute, but for now all you need to know is that he knows a lot about early recorded sound. And of course with no electrical intervention at all. It's all just the force of the voice going down that horn. The machine was a phonograph. A man working for Thomas Edison was going to record Lee singing. It just blew people away. They just figured it was a ventriloquism thing going on. I mean, nobody could believe a machine would talk, so... Um, just to hear a scratchy old voice was novel. I'm Tobias Black, and this is Artifactual from 1895 Films. This story begins at the Jersey Shore. I cannot wait to get to the Jersey Shore. This summer, everyone goes to the shore. Yeah, that Jersey Shore. Except that back in 1899, it was a very different place. It was a destination for East Coast urbanites to escape the heat and disease of city summers. Think elegant Victorian hotels with enormous wraparound porches and afternoon tea. One of the regulars at the Hotel Brunswick in Asbury Park was a young Philadelphia doctor named Lee B. Woodcock. He had graduated from medical school the year before and was planning a two-year trip to Vienna to complete his education. But in Asbury Park, Lee inhabited a different role. An Asbury Park Press article from the time describes him as, quote, a singer of note and a well-known composer as well. And we might have had to take the newspaper's word for it, except for another notice carried in the same paper that summer. The headline read, Inventor Edison will take cylinders at Ocean Grove. Edison first demonstrated the phonograph back in 1876. But early versions were extremely delicate. They were made out of tinfoil. It took another 10 years and an assist from Alexander Graham Bell's company before the phonograph became commercially viable. And these early commercial recordings didn't look like what we think of as records. First of all, they were cylinders, not discs, roughly the shape of a can of Campbell's soup or a roll of toilet paper. And second of all, they were made out of brown wax. This is one of the wax ones, for example. So this is all just a solid piece of wax. This is, this is brown wax here. I'm repairing this for a friend. Um, so you can see it's, it's much softer. Well, my name is Michael Conchalian. I'm a dentist. Dr. Conchalian's being modest. He is a dentist and, I'm sure, a very good one. But he's also one of the world's foremost experts on early recordings, known as wax cylinders. He wrote a book about them, and he was nominated for a Grammy. I bet your dentist isn't Grammy nominated. And Dr. Conchalian has a lot of old record players in his home. This is a 1899 Edison Triumph this machine. Uh, 1894 Regina Music Box. This is a World War uh, I Edison disc player. This is a player. mid-1920s, uh, it's called a Sonora uh, disc player. That's a 1920s uh, player system that plays with all the expression of the original this artist. Edison's system. disc setup. Our TV is sitting on an original Edison disc holder here, so. But Dr. Conchalian doesn't just collect this stuff. He also repairs these old recordings. In dental school, I taught myself tricks how to put these back together. Yeah, everything was, was applied dental skills. It's patience and time, and I have a lot of adapted dental instruments that I've created over the years, and I keep them in my little box of tricks here. They each have different names. They're adapted dental instruments. Uh, dental Explorer. I got it in dental school. I never used it on a patient, but I adapted it to the use of cylinder repair. Come on out of here, guy. Uh, that's a Ward's Carver. 
and so this is the surface of the cylinder. If I placed wax and it's and it's a little higher than the external surface of the cylinder, I'll polish it back real carefully. And these recordings need to be repaired because they're so rare. They're delicate, and for many of these songs, there's only one copy left. When they started to get displaced by disc records in the 1920s, few people thought to save these wax cylinders. Back then, they were just the first of many outdated music formats, something anybody who watched vinyl get displaced by cassettes, or cassettes by CDs, or CDs by MP3s is familiar with. And it's one of the great ironies of this story that Edison didn't originally want these wax cylinders, which fundamentally changed our relationship to music, to be used for music at all. He was trying to invent a, 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 a telegraph repeater. He just said this should be, you know, it should be used for talking books, talking clocks, talking dolls. For the record, a talking doll from the early days of recorded sound seems like a terrible idea. Anybody who's heard him thought, that sounds haunted. It's like, ah, scare you to death, you know. Um, <coughs> well, he had all these ideas. The buying public disagreed. They wanted entertainment. And pretty soon, even cranky Edison realized where the money in recorded sound really was. Music. People couldn't get enough of it. Here's Sir Arthur Sullivan, half of famous musical theater duo Gilbert and Sullivan, after a wine-fueled dinner with Edison in 1888. There may have still been some room for improvement on the fidelity side, so let me translate. Sullivan says, For myself, I can only say that I am astonished and somewhat terrified at the result of this evening's experiments. Astonished at the wonderful power you have developed, and terrified at the thought that so much hideous and bad music may be put on record forever. And that's exactly what Edison did. He sent people around the country to start making recordings that he could then sell. And they weren't just recording the musical stars of their day. There were very few people in the beginning of the phonograph industry that ever got the idea of, oh, why don't we, re why don't we record somebody who's famous, somebody people that would want to hear, a famous opera star in that time, or famous singer, or famous people. Nobody ever, it didn't occur to anybody in the beginning. And this is why recordings of famous people back that far are so dang uncommon. Instead, Edison and his competitors would often record amateurs, people like the young Dr. Lee B. Woodcock. Lee made at least four recordings for Edison in the summer of 1899. Because I Love You, A May Morning, Four Leaf Clover, and the Toreador song from the opera Carmen. Edison didn't normally make recordings himself. He would send out employees to do it, which is probably how Lee's songs got recorded in Asbury Park, New Jersey in the summer of 1899 even though Edison was staying at another hotel right down the boardwalk. He normally would not go to record a band. He would send, send his people there. But we know from newspaper accounts that Edison was personally supervising the recording of a 500-strong chorus in nearby Ocean Grove just two days after Lee made his first recording. So who knows? Maybe Edison was in the audience at one of Lee's concerts and liked what he heard. We have only one song from that first session on July 30th. But about a week later, Lee came back and recorded at least three more songs on August 8th, 1899. On August 9th, according to society notices in the local newspapers, Lee left for New York, where he boarded an ocean liner called the Frederick the Great, which would take him as far as Bremen in northern Germany. From there, he'd make his way to Vienna to complete his medical training. Vienna at the turn of the century was one of the most vibrant cities in the world. Philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein rubbed shoulders with Sigmund Freud. Painter Gustav Klimt was busy getting in trouble for his supposedly obscene paintings on the ceiling of the Great Hall at the University of Vienna. Bruckner, Mahler, and Schoenberg were all composing radical new music in the city. For a young doctor with musical ambitions, it must have been a heady experience. When Lee returned to the U.S. after his European tour, he landed in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where his mother eventually came to live with him. He practiced medicine, apparently with some success, for over a decade. 
Lee returned to Vienna twice more over the next few years to pursue unspecified, quote, special projects in medicine. But after the last trip he made in 1911, something had changed. The next year, he abandoned his medical practice altogether. He was going to open a school. He was going to teach singing. I asked Dr. Kanchelian if he'd ever thought about ditching dentistry to just work with old recordings full time, like Lee did with his own medical practice. Yeah, except I wouldn't, if I could have known something like that, I would have thought about it seriously. But I didn't know anybody who even knew what these cylinder things were. I mean, it just wasn't going to be. And, uh, <laughs> and dentistry was a dream since I was three or four years old. Once Lee had made his hobby his profession in 1912, he needed a new hobby. In his spare time, Lee helped invent a language called Arulo, something like Esperanto, and he found time to lead the Democratic Socialist Party of Scranton. Lee operated his vocal studio for the next 23 years before retiring to Sedona, Arizona in 1935. A photo from the 1950s shows a white-haired man with a thin face and eyebrows that droop at steep 45-degree angles away from the bridge of his nose. Dr. Lee B. Woodcock died in 1958 at the age of 87 and was buried in a plot overlooking the Grand Canyon in a casket he had designed himself. We don't know what Lee made of his brush with Edison, or at least with Edison's recording engineers, but apparently it had left him unimpressed. In 1906, the Tribune, a Scranton newspaper, carried an article about a talk Lee gave about tuberculosis. Lee began his lecture by, quote, denying the statement of the wizard Edison that science would make such progress in this century that there would be no need of physicians. And Lee was right. We still need doctors. So maybe it's for the best that Dr. Conchalian didn't quit dentistry. Whatever Lee may have thought of Edison, recordings like his set the stage for a revolution an entire industry of recorded sound. But aside from any historical significance, I think Lee's songs are beautiful and a little bit haunting in their own right. I asked Dr. Conchalian why these old recordings are so important to him. I mean, I love my favorite novels or time travel novels. I just, I don't know. Couldn't tell you why it's so fascinating to me. But to actually hear it, you're experiencing it. You know, if you want to really submerge yourself, it's one of the best time machines I know because you're actually hearing it. It's like their presence is in the room. Thanks for listening. Artifactual is written and produced by me, Tobiah Black. Our producer is Will DePagne. Our executive producers are Tom Jennings and Ellen Farmer at 1895 Films. Fran from 17th Street Audio did the sound design and mixing for this episode. If you want to learn more about our documentaries, you can find us on Twitter at 1895films or at 1895films.com.